The next thing we'll cover is interprocedural analysis and link time optimization. And the question that we're going to ask ourselves here is, are economies of scale real? Do we benefit by having a much wider view of the program uh, in terms of making decisions about what to optimize? Does a whole program optimization really make a difference? So if the compiler can look over your entire code base at once, can it make decisions that make your program better in binary form? We have to interrogate this a little bit by starting with information that is necessary to make those decisions. So we will begin there. This is much less of an issue for Rust than it is for other languages, but you may well be programming in C or C++ someday soon. You know, in fact, concurrently in this term, if you're taking some other courses that are using it, uh, or uh, have another reason, you know, employment or otherwise, uh, where you're going to be writing in those languages. Um, and uh, one of the things that we have to consider uh, as the compiler is alias and pointer analysis. And I mentioned earlier that uh, in some cases it could all be connected. Um, but the compiler needs to know about what parts of memory each statement reads from or writes to. Uh, and um, that's somewhat easy when talking about scalar variables which are stored on the stack. You know, X is allocated here, do this, do that. But it becomes a lot harder uh, when we have pointers or arrays which can alias. Uh, and you know, alias in the sense is you, could, is you could have two pointers pointing to the same memory location. Uh, in other languages, you, you can have arrays that overlap. Um, those kinds of things all count as alias. Um, so when we think about it in C or C++, you know, it's kind of anything goes um, that there are the potential for um, pointers where you say, look, uh, I'm just going to assign an address, I'm going to this, I'm going to that, uh, I, I'm going to take you know, address of the stack allocated variable, and I'm going to you know, increment it, so I'm crawling around in the stack, you can do all kinds of bad things. In Rust, if you turn on unsafe mode, you can do some of those things. Uh, and you know, unsafe is a big hint to the compiler that's like, I don't know, somebody might have done something nasty here and that might disable some optimization because the compiler will say, well, I don't think I can trust this. Um, but the whole idea about borrowing uh, is that it controls aliasing. It makes it clear who has the memory and who is uh, using it right now. Uh, and prevents a lot of questions about what is assigned to what uh, and who has a pointer where. Um, so one of the things that alias analysis is useful for uh, is that if we know the two pointers don't alias, then we know that their effects are independent, so it's okay to move things around. Uh, if in the previous example that we saw of combining loops A and B, where the, you know, the loop uh, is we're going to iterate over A and assign A at index I equals 4 and assign B at index I equals 7, if you know that A and B don't overlap, you could do those in any order and you can do them in parallel and you can do stuff like that. In a language where those things can overlap, that might not actually work as intended uh, because if uh, A and B overlap, then uh, if you do them in the wrong order, then some memory locations end up with four when they should have seven, or the other way around, I suppose. Um, so controlled aliasing makes it a lot easier to reason about this in other languages. Uh, and um, in C and C++, there exists the keyword restrict, uh, which is used to say, I, as the programmer, promise the compiler that these things don't alias. Uh, again, in the uh, previous version of the course where we taught it in C and C++, there was a long discussion of that, uh, including you know, a, a, little, uh, a little digression into why it works uh, and what actually you are suggesting to the compiler and what could go wrong if you lie. Please don't lie to the compiler. Uh, it's, it's only trying to help you. Um, and again, that kind of thing is not really as big of a problem in Rust as long as you are keeping things safe. If you go into unsafe code uh, where you can take raw pointers to things and change things and do stuff, then yes, you do risk uh, a lot of the same issues. Um, there is also uh, shape analysis, which uh, builds on pointer analysis, and that is the, where the compiler can look at a particular data structure and make a determination that it is in fact a tree rather than a list. 
uh, which does potentially allow for some things to be done in parallel uh, because we know that if we go down one branch of the tree it won't affect the other branches that sort of thing uh, another thing that we do with whole program analysis is call graph analysis uh, and um, to do the interprocedural analysis that is uh, considering what happens uh, across more than one function or more than one procedure uh, we have to know what calls what um, if everything is a C style function call where you just you know call a function and the function returns something maybe uh, and that's it you have like a very clear uh, very clear idea about what calls what that would be the simple uh, version. Unfortunately, it's very hard um, when you have virtual methods uh, in, in C++ or Java. You know, you, you call the honk method on a, a vehicle class, but vehicle is an abstract class, so you know, it calls actually, well, the object that we have in hand is a car, uh, and car has its own implementation of the honk method, that kind of thing. Um, that is a lot harder because it's not as obvious uh, at the time of calling uh, honk what kind of honk is going to happen is this you know, a car is it a truck is it a train we don't know uh, even function pointers throw a big wrench into that um, rust has indirect function calls and function pointers and dynamic dispatch uh, through traits uh, in much the same way that we talk about you know, interfaces uh, having implementations and uh, abstract classes and that sort of thing. So that makes it a little bit hard. Um, so it is something that the compiler will work on and it will try to figure out what calls what uh, to make some determinations about whether things are going to happen. However, this is uh, a struggle. Um, Devirtualization is kind of a specific version of the uh, call graph information being put to use. Uh, and this is trying to convert a virtual function call to a direct call. Uh, and virtual method calls have a potential for being slow because there's a branch to predict. If we see, okay, we're going to call vehicle.honk, is that a car or is it a truck? We're going to make a prediction and we could be wrong. Um, in general, to actually find out where we're going to go, we have to read the object's v table, which says, like, hey, here's the executable code for this version. That'll get the job done. Uh, and it can also impede some other optimizations where you can say, well, I'm not sure what's going to happen here, so I'm just going to you know, assume something. And you know, the compiler, when it doesn't know, will take the safe option. And the safe option is usually slower uh, than uh, the alternative. So um, if that kind of thing happens, um, you know, it's not wrong, it's just slow. What devirtualization says is, look, um, could we replace virtual method calls with non-virtual ones? That is, if the compiler can work out um, that uh, there's no trucks that are ever constructed in the program, it's only cars, then it can say, well, look, if I know that honk is going to be invoked on a vehicle, I know that's always going to be a car, and we can just skip figuring out what kind of object it is. We can just go straight there and say, yep, it is the car version. That's convenient. Um, if we know that this is the case uh, and it replaces a virtual call with a non-virtual call. Um, so you eliminate the vtable access, you skip over checking what kind of thing it is, you just go straight to the implementation that is valid. Uh, there is also in, in C++ rapid type analysis, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if it's used in Rust, but it analyzes the entire program uh, and figures out that only one particular type of object is uh, instantiated, uh, and that would make it a little bit easier. In the example that we see here, uh, you know, we've clearly made uh, you know, a particular instance of uh, the foo trait uh, as being of type bar, and the compiler can look at that and say, well, I know for sure uh, that uh, this type is going to be either um, X or Y, bar or baz, uh, and then devirtualize it accordingly. Okay, um, we also talked a little bit about inlining. Uh, and inlining says, look, uh, dear compiler, uh, don't actually make this a function call, just like copy and paste the code instead of calling the function, and therefore there's no function call overhead. 
Um, and that's good uh, if, if it's worthwhile, right? A uh, function call has a small but non-zero overhead. Uh, and um, the other thing that it really helps with is it enables some optimizations that would not have been possible before. And I mentioned that previously when we talked about dead code elimination, that if the function is f of 5 uh, and we didn't do an inlining, the compiler might not be able to determine actually what's supposed to happen here because it would say, I don't know, f could return anything. Um, but by actually inlining it, then there is some unlocking of other context-sensitive operations that uh, scalar elimination, common sub-expression elimination, and that kind of thing uh, that could happen. So that sounds good. And you might be thinking, well, in that case, inline everything. I mean, you, you can, you shouldn't, but you could tell the compiler that. Again, it might not uh, agree with you. It might not obey that instruction. But in Rust, you can give a hint. You could say, uh, use the inline hint, which says, I think you should do an inline expansion here. And maybe it will, and maybe it won't. Uh, and you can say always, and you can say never. And never says, I insist, I really want you to do this. Uh, and never says, please don't inline this, even if you think it's a good idea. So, I mean, it sounds like it's you know, only upside. So let's inline everything. Um, the negative to that is that the binary size of your program increases, uh, and that might not sound bad on its own. You know, oh no, I'm so worried I have to download you know, 8 megabytes instead of uh, 7. Uh, it's not like that. Uh, it's more a problem in terms of um, more uh, trips to memory because we have fewer cache hits. Uh, and as we know already, uh, you know, going to cache is fast and going to memory is slow. So anything we could do that would eliminate extra trips to memory is helpful. Um, when we're looking at our level one instruction cache, right, you know, the cache doesn't, doesn't know or care that the next page of instructions is exactly the same as the previous one. Um, it would end up you know, just saying, all right, well, I'm loading the next one in, and, and that's what we're going to do. And it doesn't know that it's the same, and it doesn't care. Uh, but of course, if it if it's um, not forced to do that, we can just reuse the instructions that we already have in the cache. That would be preferable, assuming that uh, we didn't inline absolutely everything all the time. Uh, and some inlines can actually grow pretty rapidly um, if, if you are trying to, uh, you know, grow... Uh, Trying to, trying to do something with C++ extended constructors or something, you can end up generating quite a lot of instructions and, uh, and they can ignore you. Uh, and if you try to do something like take an address of an inline function uh, and use it, you know, take that as a function pointer, the compiler will say, well, I can't actually inline this because somebody needs it as an actual function. And again, if you have virtual functions and stuff like that, um, you can convince the compiler that you don't know what you're doing and it will say, all right, thanks for the suggestion, but uh, I'm going to pass. Um, debugging can also be a little bit more difficult um, because you can't really set a breakpoint in a function that doesn't actually exist. The code gets moved from one place to another, uh, preventing you from actually setting that, uh, that breakpoint. Um, and therefore, if uh, debug symbols are on, the compiler might just actually not inline at all. So, I mean, that's one way around it. Uh, sometimes they do, but it's typically more of a pain and you end up with stuff like all oh, the source code doesn't match the binary uh, warnings in your debugger. That can happen too. Uh, and the other big minus about uh, library, uh, about inlining is in library design. Uh, if you change any function in your library that gets inlined, then any users of that library have to recompile their program if the library changes. Uh, normally, if you just you know, change the internal implementation and the API doesn't change, then nobody has to recompile. They can just reuse the same uh, reuse the same code that they originally wrote, and the function call and the return values uh, are the same. Uh, and if you do an inline function, um, this is a non-binary compatible change. Change is hard, change is painful, uh, and oftentimes we want to avoid that. Um, you know, it's, it's unpleasant for users of it. Uh, and you know, ultimately, if you are making a library and you're publishing the library, if you do this too often, um, people will be mad. You know, they don't want to have to recompile uh, or make significant changes to their library you know, just at a whim. Uh, sometimes it's necessary. You know, this is a, a security update or something like that. Uh, however, um, 
be careful uh, about how many breaking changes uh, that you actually end up deploying. Would not be a problem if you use non-inline functions. Uh, you could just execute the new function dynamically at runtime uh, as expected. Um, okay, yeah. So yeah, compilers can inline based on suggestions that you give it, but usually it's more based on uh, heuristics, uh, based on uh, the compiler's own view of the world, whether it thinks this is a good idea or not. Um, yep. Yeah. The uh, other things uh, that prevent perhaps devirtualization and inlining is if the compiler is not able to work out the heap effects of functions. Uh, again, we know here that uh, we could propagate the constant value of 2 in this code to the print statement as long as we know that function f does not write to n. Uh, but Rust helps us there. Obviously, if n is not mutable, then it makes it easier to be certain that that's the case. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, you know, if ownership was not transferred, then you can know that, oh, it wasn't used, uh, it wasn't altered by something, uh, and anything that helps the compiler make those determinations helps it to propagate this constant value and therefore save some time. Uh, and then there is tail recursion elimination, the, the last uh, of the uh, last of the whole program optimizations we want to talk about. Uh, and this optimization is mandatory in some functional languages. Um, uh, and we can do this uh, where we replace a call by a go-to at the compiler level. Oh no, I, I said a bad word again. Um, and, and that is here that you know, if you have a function here, Fibonacci, uh, and the, the internal function Fibonacci LR doesn't have to return control to its caller because the recursive call is in the tail position. That is to say, if we're returning a value from function A that's going to be returned as the value from the caller, so function A calls uh, function A is called by B, uh, and the return value of A is then immediately taken by B and is the return value of B, you could skip all of that and you could just send this data back in a more efficient route. Uh, and that is actually tail recursion elimination. Uh, and it avoids some function call overhead uh, where you are just saying, you know what, here, th this is the final value and we don't have to do all the steps of passing it up every call uh, to every call on the stack. Uh, and we can just say, yep, uh, here's here's the final value. Take it and go. 